Okay, good. So uh, the break allowed me to uh, reproduce these formulas there in the notes. And I've just summarized uh, some of the forms that appear in uh, 3 plus 1 dimensional physics. So this is in um, 2 dimensional physics, 3 dimensional physics, and in 4 dimensional space time. And uh, if you look at the tables, there's some obvious patterns. And uh, one of the first things hopefully you'll notice is these numbers should look kind of familiar. Um, those are the numbers in, that appear in Pascal's triangle. And uh, also you should notice that these numbers are symmetric. So the number of uh, p forms is equal to the number of uh, n minus p forms, where n is the number of dimensions. So the number here, the zero form, which is just like functions, which I can think of having a basis as just one, is the same as the number of two forms in two dimensions. And say, in another way, the number of one forms in four dimensional space time is the same as the number of uh, three forms in uh, space three plus one dimensional space time. Okay. So these patterns uh, suggest a map, suggest that there should be some way of, say, mapping uh, p dimensional forms to uh, um, n minus p dimensional forms. So let me just summarize that. So looking at the tables, so we see a pattern. Okay, so the number of key forms. Or the number of the basis p-form basis is equal to the number of n minus p-forms. Okay, and uh, because we recognize these numbers as coming from Pascal's triangles, uh, I'll just write down, so the formula is other binomial coefficients, the coefficients of Pascal's triangles, so that's n p, which is equal to n minus p, equal to n factorial divided by p factorial and uh, n here is the number of dimensions. Good. So um, in order to find a map between uh, p forms and n minus p forms, we need something uh, called the levi civita symbol. Let me just define for you the Hodge dual and then uh, explain to everything that appears in the Hodge dual. So, the Hodge dual is a map which maps uh, p forms to n minus p forms, and I'm going to define it in terms of how it acts on the basis forms. Let's say I have a p form basis. There are p one forms that are wedged together, like that. And then, in order to map that to an n minus p form, we have some combinatorial factor for convenience. And then I write this as u1, u2, dot, 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 and p. And I have mu p plus 1. Dot, 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 all up all to mu n, and then I multiply this by dx mu p plus 1, which dot 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 dx mu okay, so on the left on the left hand side here, I have a p form basis element. On the right hand side, there are p minus n. And this, so this is a map which takes it from that to that. That's a little bit abstract and hard to understand, so we'll go through some examples. And I also need to explain to you what this epsilon object is, although many of you have probably seen it before, I hope. So we call epsilon 
for the divide so this is the norm okay and it's uh, completely anti-symmetric in all of its arguments so it's some object which has a whole of indices and if I exchange any two of those indices it's going to flip sign <coughs> so the fact that it's completely anti-symmetric means there's only one independent component um, so it's completely Yeah. Is, is it some 
Uh, no. Uh, it's the Hodge-Joule uh, of the, the, the maximum volume form is just a number. So let's let's work. Let's see. Let's let's go. The best way to understand this is just to work through a couple examples. It looks for kind of difficult enough, but, but uh, let's look at a couple examples. So let's look in first. Let's look in just two-dimensional space because that's easiest place to do anything on trivial. I guess you could look in one-dimensional space, which is rarely trivial, but let's not do that. Okay, so let's look in uh, two-dimensional space. I'm going to take the Hodge joule of one. Okay, so that's going to be, so, um, okay, well, let's, let's, um, so that's going to be equal to epsilon uh, epsilon i. So here, so um, p is zero and n is two. Okay, so I have one over two factorial. Then I have my epsilon tensor, and then I have my basis forms. But because I'm dealing with one, this, uh, sorry. Um, so, okay, good. So I first take the indices of my form. Um, because I'm dealing with one, there are no indices here. So then I have to fill it, fill it up with the rest of the indices. So I have uh, ij. So those are the remaining indices of my epsilon tensor in, in two dimensions. And then uh, I use the remaining force, so I have dx i wedge dx j. Okay, that is j. So the Hodge joule of 1 gives me the volume form. And uh, then I carry out the sum. So that's going to be 1 over 2 epsilon 1, 2 dx 1 wedge d. Uh, x2 plus epsilon 2 1 dx2 which dx1 and uh, this is equal to 1 so that will be equal to minus 1 but when I swap those two forms around I pick up a nice other minus 1 so this is just equal to dx which dy okay so let's have a look at uh, Another one. I think I'll go through these in actually quite a lot of detail because it's it's when you first see the Hodge jewel, it seems a little abstract, but once you get used to playing around with it, it's actually not that hard to work. So I think it's a good idea to sort of apologies to people who've seen this before, but I think it's a good idea to go through these uh, in detail. Okay. So the Hodge jewel of the form dx. So let me just uh, so let's call x x one. Now, I'm in two dimensions, and I've got a 1 form, so I've got 2 minus 1, so I've got 1 over 1 factorial, which is just 1, let me just write it to be uh, clear, and then I've got 1 index here, so I start, there I have epsilon 1, and I've got 1 remaining index in two dimensions, so I have an i there, and then I have a sum over the one form basis. Okay, so in this case, uh, the Hodge dual is mapping one form to one forms, okay, because two minus one is one. And then carrying out the sum, so I have, uh, so let me lower these indices, I can always do that in space without losing anything, so that's one, epsilon one i, dx i. The epsilon tensor is completely anti-symmetric, so I'm only going to pick up anything when i equals 2, check that I got the sign right, so this is epsilon 1, 2, dx2, so this is just equal to dy. So the Hodge dual of dx is dy, and uh, let's work out uh, Let's work out the Hodge dual of dy. They're a little bit quicker now. Um, 
So that's going to be equal to epsilon 2i dx i. So that's going to be equal to minus dx. And finally, if I look at the Hodge dual of dx wedge dy, that's going to be equal to epsilon 1, 2 times 1 is equal to 1. Okay, now we can, another interesting thing, another thing that we can look at is, is what, yeah, question? Should there not be a 1 over 2 factorial? Uh, should there not be a 1 over 2 factorial? <coughs> okay, do you want me to go through it in detail? Fine. Okay, are you happy? Okay. Right, so um, we can use this and look at the, the square. What happens if we act with the square on, let's say, 1? So that's equal to the Hodge dual of dx wedge dy. So that's equal to 1. So the Hodge dual squared on 1 just gives you 1. On the other hand, you go through the same thing and look through the Hodge dual squared acting on dx, dxi. Okay, so there's a, when you go from dy to dx, you pick up a minus sign. When you go from dx to dy, you don't pick up a minus sign. So the square of that is equal to minus e tilde xi. And finally, e squared acting on the two-dimensional area form just gives you the two-dimensional area form. Okay, so the, uh, the Hodge still squared is either 1 or minus 1. And it seems like it's either 1 or minus 1, depending on the type of form you're acting on. And uh, uh, so let me just write down what you get in, in three dimensions. You can check for yourself the calculation. And this, you want me to go through it in detail. Are people happy that they can work this out themselves? Or do you want me to go through, who wants me to go through at least one more example? Nobody. Good. I won't go through one. If 
I take the Hodge dual of dt, I'm going to get uh, minus dx, which is z, um, and um, uh, etc. You can check out what the other ones are. Say, for example, in If I take the wages dx dy, I get a uh, dy wedge z, etc. Okay, so once again, in, in three plus one dimensions, I get two, the Hodge dual takes two forms to two forms. And uh, let's say, for example, the x wedge dy wedge dt is equal to minus. Okay, and uh, okay, let me final one. If I take the Hodge dual of the volume form, that's equal to minus one. So the Hodge dual squared in uh, Space turns out to be <coughs> check this the Hodge dual squared of the p form is equal to minus one to the p minus one of fp. Okay. So let me just tell you what the general formula is. So the general formula. So in Rn, so if I have n special dimensions, if I act the Hodge dual squared on a p form, it will be equal to minus 1 p n minus p of p. Okay. It's either a plus sign or a minus sign, and whether it's a plus or minus sign depends on the number of dimensions and what kind of form I'm dealing with. And in Rn, comma 1, uh, I squared, I want to do a squared, I'll just leave out the form. It's just an extra minus one. And that, from, that extra minus one comes from the minus one we get when we raise the special index. Okay, you have different formulas if you're using the mostly negative metric. So this is n minus p. Is it n one or n minus one? So n r r r n comma one. So you've got n special dimensions and. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm slightly. Okay, so let me so let me use a different number. Let me call that uh, d. Uh, as long as it's consistent. Yeah, it's not it's not quite consistent with what I was calling n before. So let me see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at least I hope that's good. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. No, you're right. Sorry, you're right. So this is. So if I have r n minus 1, comma 1, then I have that form. Yes, thank you. Correct my notes. Okay. So that's the Hodge dual, and uh, it's it's very useful for um, it, well, it's required for a lot of uh, expressing a lot of physics equations uh, in terms of forms, uh, as you would see if we had another tutorial. Uh, the Hodge dual is essential for writing down Maxwell's equations, for instance, using um, using differential forms, and actually. Anytime you want to write down Lagrangians uh, using differential forms, you're going to have to have the Hodge dual. So it's, it's something very useful in the language of forms. Okay. Even more useful. Um, is the 
exterior derivative of forms. And the exterior derivative of forms encompasses both uh, kind of derivative operators you learn about in three-dimensional calculus, vector calculus. So the exterior form gives you a single way, a single, no, single notation or a single way of thinking of both the gradient, okay, so three things, the gradient, the divergence, and the curl is all summarized in terms of one operator called the exterior um, derivative. And what's, what's more, the exterior derivative gives a very nice way of expressing Stokes' form in any number of dimensions on any number of forms. Okay, so let's talk about uh, generalized Stokes' theorem. And uh, the exterior derivative. Okay, so let me define, I need to define what the exterior derivative is so that I can tell you the generalized Stokes' theorem. So let's start off with some P form. So let's say I have some P form and I have components F from 1 or F from P and F from 1 which above the is the Right. And then the exterior derivative, which you write like that, will take a key form to a, a P plus 1 form. And uh, we can just define it in terms of uh, how it acts. So I'm going to define. Okay, so this now is a p plus one form that I get when I act on the p form with that exterior derivative, and that's defined as one over p factorial. The differential acting on p one comma p. Uh, this thing, which is e one yes, p, and then this is nothing. That there is shorthand for f e one dot e p partial derivative with respect to nu dx nu. Okay, so this is a this is a one form whose components are the partial derivative of the components of the, the p form. Right. So now I have um, so now this will be one over one p factorial f u one u p comma nu, and then that's multiplied by d x nu. <coughs> dx u1 plus of dx u. Okay, now this is a p plus 1 form basis. This is completely anti symmetric in all its indices. So in the sum, you're going to pick out the completely anti symmetric part of this object. So this will be equal to the completely anti symmetric part of that object. And uh, so now, uh, this will be the component of a p plus 1 form. So this is going to be also p factorial of the components of the, the p plus 1 form uh, uh, so this has components nu 1 or up to nu p plus 1 times dx one which dot 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 which all the way up to dx nu p plus one. So I can read off the component comparing this object and that object I can read off the components of the p plus one form. So that implies that uh, the components of df, d tilde f 
uh, alpha dot, dot, dot beta gamma are equal to, I need a p plus 1 to cancel out that uh, the difference in the factorial if the anti-symmetric anti uh, part of A beta comma and gamma. Any questions? That's just from comparing that. Right. So um, now there's a very important property of the exterior derivative, and that is that it uh, squares to zero. The d tilde squared is equal to zero. So in order to see that, let's just consider d tilde squared acting on some function. So if I act with d tilde squared on some function, that's going to give me f comma u nu dx nu, which dx nu. Now this is anti-symmetric in mu and nu. Uh, partial derivatives commute, so this is symmetric in mu and nu. So this will be equal to minus f uh, mu nu dx nu, which dx nu. And uh, that means that it has to be equal to zero. So in general, if I take, uh, so that was just for a function, but if I take d squared acting on some p form, that's going to be equal to 1 over p factorial, d squared of f mu 1, p times dx mu 1, which dot 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 dx mu p. And in the same way that this is going to be 0, I can think, I can just think of that as just some function, and that's also going to be 0. So d squared acting on any form gives me 0. Good. Now we can uh, look at some formulae in the Tulosa and Vector Calculus. And we can re-express them in the language of forms. Good. So let's consider a one form uh, p tilde. So now let's look, let's look in three-dimensional space. So we've got some one form px plus py y plus dz d. So we've got some people, those components. And let me calculate the, let me do it on the next board. So I'm going to do this explicitly, also because it will give you some feel for how the exterior works. So p tilde acting on p tilde. So that's going to be uh, px comma x. And now I'm going to get a dx tilde, which dx. Uh, I need a lot of space. Px comma y, dy, which dx. That's px comma z, z which x plus p y comma x uh, sorry p y comma sorry uh, p y comma x uh, d x which c y plus p y comma y d y which y plus p y comma z the <coughs> z wedge y plus z comma x dx z okay I need two more things to go d z comma y d y z plus p z comma z 
dz where dz. Okay, good. So there are three terms which are immediately zero. So dx wedge dz has to be zero. Sorry, dx wedge dx has to be zero. Um, dy wedge dy is zero. And uh, dz wedge dz is equal to zero. And then uh, I can collect everything in terms of my basis forms. So this is going to be dy comma x minus dx comma y. Uh, let me just get the order right. dx wedge y plus uh, dz comma y minus dy comma z dy wedge z plus uh, dx comma z minus dz comma x uh, dz wedge dy. Okay, yeah, so do, do, these, do, do these components look familiar? What does that look like? Curl. Okay, so these are the components of the curl. So this has a uh, If I took a vector which had the components px, dy, and dz, um, those, would be the, those would be the components of the curl. So now let's consider a two form, which I'm going to write uh, in a way that should make sense from there. So I'm going to call bx, uh, dy, wedge, dz. Okay, so I'm calling that bx because um, this is related to the x component of the curl of P. Okay. Plus dy, uh, dz wedge dx, plus dz uh, dx wedge dy. Um, Okay, now let's take the exterior derivative of d f of d f two. Okay, now I'm going to be a little bit uh, more clever than I was when I do this. I'm going to notice that if I take the partial derivative with respect to y or z, if I take the partial derivative with respect to y, so I'm going to get a b y b x comma y d y which d y, so that's going to give me zero. So any Time I'm going to get something non-zero is when I take the partial derivative with respect to x. So this is equal to bx comma x, dx wedge dy wedge dz plus by comma y dy um, wedge dz wedge dx plus dz uh, comma z, d, uh, dz wedge dx wedge dy. Okay, and these are all cyclic permutations of each other. So this is actually going to be equal to, what are these the components of? So these are the components of the divergence of d. So this is equal to the divergence of d uh, dx dy wedge dz. So coming back to P, the fact that the exterior derivative squared acting on P is equal to zero is the same as something you should be familiar with, which is that the divergence of the curl of P is equal to zero. So that's just one formula which comes out. And all those uh, formulae that, that you are used to in two-dimensional vector calculus uh, can be related to uh, form, formula forms. So let's, uh, let's look at another example. So let me just take a function. Let 
Let me just take a function f. So if I work out the exterior derivative just acting on the functions, that's going to be equal to um, f comma x dx plus f comma y dy plus f comma z dz. So what are those? What are the components of this of this form? This is the gradient. So this, that has the components of the gradient, and then the fact that d tilde squared f is equal to zero. If I take the if I take the d of this again, we just saw that that's going to give me the curl. So d squared f equals zero is the same as saying that the curl of the gradient is equal to zero. Good. Um, right? How am I doing for time? Uh, Ten to eleven. Ten to eleven. Okay, so I will um, skip the. I think I will skip the Leibniz property of forms. You can have a look in the notes yourselves for those who are interested. And uh, I'll get to. I will just now have the language at least to. Almost all the language, at least, introduced the generalized Stokes' theorem. But first, I have to define something called the boundary operator. This is just notation, really. Okay, so if I have a, so the boundary operator, which people normally write using the same symbol that other people use for partial derivatives, so the boundary operator maps. Uh, a p volume to a p minus one volume, but not just any p minus one volume, namely the boundary of that p minus one volume. So, for example, if I took the boundary <coughs> of the interval a b, that would be equal to a uh, union. The boundary of, of that interval is just, uh, just the endpoint. So here I have that. In pictures, that is equal to that. And uh, so, for example, also, I take the boundary of the disk, that's equal to a circle, etc. So D acting on that. Okay, now I have, so that was just some notation. And uh, interestingly, uh, just like uh, the exterior derivative uh, squares to zero, the boundary operator squares to zero, so d e squared is also equal to zero. This is a fact in topology that I'm not going to prove. I'll just state to you that boundaries have no boundaries. Okay, obviously to prove that I have to define everything properly and introduce all of topology which I have no interest in. Right, so now I've got all the language for defining uh, having your Stokes is there. So let's say I have a um, a P form. So let's say I have a, a p plus 1 form, but that p plus 1 form is not just any p plus 1 form. I can write that p plus 1 form as the exterior derivative of some p form. And this is going to be, I'm evaluating over some p plus 1 dimensional volume. Okay, so this is a p plus 1 form. I can integrate it over a p plus 1 volume. So the generalized Stokes theorem.
Okay, so that tells you that this, and basically what the generalized Stokes theorem does, if you want to think about pictures, is we take this D, and now it just acts on the boundary as a loading. So this is equal to the integral over the boundary of C plus 1 of the original form. Okay, and that's the generalized Stokes' theorem. So all the theorems you've seen, uh, you've seen in three-dimensional vector calculus about integrals, if you take the correct form, whether, you know, for line integrals relating to a curl, so there you would take, so this would be a line integral, so this would be a one form, and that would be related to the curl of the, uh, the curl of a form over an area, so this, the curl is now a two form, well, it's expressed as a two form in this language, and that's integrated over the area, etc., um, etc. Et and the nice thing about the generalized folks is now you can work out these formulae in any number of dimensions, in, you know, whether it's in space, time, or space. And uh, if you had another tutorial, uh, you could go over trying to re-derive some of those classical um, Stokes' formulae that you know, and finding generalizations. But maybe let me start a little. Yeah, question. Is it uh, p plus one on both sides? No. Okay. So this is a bit here. I have a p plus one form which is integrated over a p plus 1 volume. Here I have a p form, which is integrated over the boundary of this p plus 1 dimensional volume. So this is actually a p dimensional volume. Okay. And this is a p plus 1 form. So there's a lot of beautiful mathematics that can be expressed in terms of, um, of forms and in terms of the relationship between, well, the relationship between boundaries and forms, which uh, plays a really important role in string theory, which I'm not going to discuss now. Okay, just to mention that uh, this is the beginning of learning that language. Maybe I'll just give you the simplest possible example. So let's say I have um, just some function. So the, simple, the simplest example of this generalized Stokes theorem is actually uh, what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus, I think. So if I just take um, df, so now this is just one, the, the exterior derivative acting on a function. Yeah, and I'm integrating it over, so now I'm integrating, I'm just going to write my integral in a slightly different way. Normally you would say integrate from a to b, but I'm going to write that as integrating from uh, from uh, on the interval a b, so that's going to be equal to, as you know. So now I just I have something which is just evaluated at two points because the boundary of this is just two points. So I don't really have an integral, but I, so I just have f, and now f is evaluated at the boundary of that. So I evaluate f at b. Okay, so this is the simplest example of the generalized Stokes' theorem, which is just the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is probably one of the first things you learn to calculus. And it's really beautiful to see that the kind of fundamental theorem of calculus is just uh, another example of Stokes' theorem, for instance. Good. Any, any questions? Okay, so uh, I encourage you to attempt the rest of the exercises, even though we don't have a tutorial session, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to touch me or email me. Yeah, questions? I said something about Einstein equation. Okay, so uh, I, okay, so there's no way I'm going to get to the einstein cartan equations, uh, well, because I have no more lectures, so I probably would need about another three lectures to get to the einstein cartan equations. Um, but the nice thing is you have the basic language now to try and understand the einstein cartan equations. So the, the einstein cartan equations are, are an efficient way of calculating the Riemann tensor in terms of um, basically use the exterior derivative and the Hodge dual acting on, um, acting on the metric and acting on sort of the, the uh, formed generalizations of the Christoffel symbols, which gives you a very efficient way. Uh, if, um, if that's something you're interested in, um, I would stop, uh, there are a lot of texts you can look at. Maybe, okay, Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler is quite long. Try to find relevant information. 
Uh, I think uh, it's covered nicely in a book by Carol, Carol's book, but I can't remember exactly which covers it nicely. But unfortunately, I apologize, I'm not going to get to the Einstein parts of the question. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah? Nothing? Good, so yeah, question. Uh, maybe just on an intuitive understanding yeah. of the hydrogen duality. Yeah. Is it wise to consider it as some kind of inversion? Which is, so if we took the Hodge dual of a one form of a zero form, yeah. the answer would be the remainder of the, of the space. Um, For instance, when you made the star one, you in two dimensions. Okay, so, so let, me, let me try to give you some feel for it in, in maybe in three dimensions. Uh, well, let's see. So, but yeah, in three dimensions we have have the right hand rule. So let me try. Let me just get to that table. Give you some idea. Okay, so in so this. Let me try and give you some intuitive feeling for it, at least in this case. Okay, so we, we start off, off right at the beginning with defining the, uh, in, in terms of defining the, uh, the, the wave product in terms of one through every juicy area. So remember I said I have the area form Okay, hopefully this will give you some intuition. Okay, so yeah, I remember the area form which was given by this. So I can pick up uh, an infinitesimal area element as, um, so here I have some infinitesimal area element, which is dx with dy. Okay, and but remember the area, I thought about this as, I can look, in terms of the old language, you know, I have some some sort of little displacement vector dx, sorry, let me call it dx, and uh, dy. I know the area was equal to, the area of that was equal to dx which dy, sorry, x, the curve of dx dy. But if I think of this, this remember, in, in three dimensions, I can think of that as a vector. So I can either think of this, this, this the Hodge dual is what takes me from this two form which describes this, uh, this area to the, the, the vector which I also, which I used to think of, which, which you can also think of describing the area, the cross product. So the Hodge, so, okay, let me just do it in terms of two vectors. So let's say I have a, a V, a U and a V. So I can think of that area as being described by V which w, or I can think of it as being described by the vector, which is v times the curl of w. And the Hodge dual, up to some signs, depending on the number of dimensions I'm in, takes me from the curl to the wedge. Okay, so that's why in three dimensions we can get away with not learning about the wedge product, because uh, I can just think of, of the curl, which, uh, so there's so, but in, in different numbers of dimensions, the, you know, the, uh, okay, well, let me give you another feeling for the intuition. I can think of a volume, remember the volume was described, let's say, in three dimensions in terms of the wedge product of three vectors. So that's, so I've got the wedge product which describes this volume. But on the other hand, I can just think of the volume as a scalar. So the Hodge dual takes me from the, uh, from the, the wedge product of three vectors which describe that volume to this, just to the number which describes that volume. Um, and then, you know, in different numbers of dimensions, there's different uh, interpretations of what, it's sort of graphical interpretations of what the Hodge dual is doing. And uh, a lot of these things are actually discussed. You want to get a kind of physical picture of uh, what the Hodge dual does, and a physical picture forms a lot of really nice pictures in in Meisner, Thorn, and Wheeler, even though it's a really long, long book, but it has a lot of nice pictures to give one a physical feeling. Okay, any other questions?